Good morning. Welcome to the DroidCon Italy webinar. My name is Lucy James. I'm one of the organizers of DroidCon Italy. Uh, glad to be welcoming you to our next one of our webinar series. Today, you'll be hearing from Andrea Malie on a cleaner architecture for Android. Hello, Andrea. Hello, Lucy. Thank you for the introduction. You're very welcome. How are you today? Well, fine, thanks. So Good. I'm excited for this, uh, for this talk. Wonderful. We're very glad to be working with you. Um, any questions can be posted in the YouTube comments um, that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is supported by AWS Amplify and brought to you by Synesthesia. Andrea, have a great webinar. Thank you very much, Lucy. So, welcome everybody to this talk. Today we're gonna talk about clean architecture on uh, with a particular um, uh, example uh, with Kotlin and Android. So, first, uh, I am Andrea Maglia. I'm actually working as a CTO in Metide, a web agency and a web and mobile agency based near Venice. I'm also organizer and founder of Google Developer Group of Venice. And you can find me on uh, GitHub, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I'm not a uh, real social addicted, but if you contact me, I promise that I will answer as soon as possible. So a quick look at the agenda for today. First, we will have a introduction to clean architecture. What is clean architecture? What's the theory behind it? And how and where it can be applied. Next, we will see how Kotlin can help us in uh, implementing clean architecture. And next, we will see a real, a practical example in Android. First of all, the book, the book Clean Architecture is uh, a book that I highly recommend for every software developer. If you didn't uh, uh, bought yet, you should buy it as soon as possible and read it because it will change uh, uh, the way you architect uh, your software and uh, develop your software forever. It, uh, it's really simple to read. Uh, it's not uh, related to a particular uh, programming language or uh, architectural framework. So it, it can be read by every developer uh, for every and applied to every language and any framework. So go buy it. Let's go with a little bit of theory. So what is clean architecture? Uh, when can we define an architecture as clean? A clean architecture is an architecture that is independent of frameworks, independent of the UI, independent of the database. So one main keyword is independent. What does it mean to be independent? It means that you don't need a particular framework to implement a clean architecture. You don't need to a particular uh, UI pattern or uh, a particular database. If you use, uh, uh, and you don't need also a particular programming language. So if you're using uh, Java, if you're using uh, JavaScript, if you're using PHP, or uh, whichever language you are using, you can implement clean architecture. If you're using the, uh, if you're implementing a command line user interface or a mobile user interface, a web user interface, you can apply the clean architecture. If you're working with a database and a SQL database or MySQL or every kind of data storage, you can implement the clean architecture. And the clean, a clean architecture is an architecture that is highly testable, being independent from framework, UI, database, and everything that can uh, tie you to a particular implementation means that your code is testable. So 
Before we go on, I want you to keep in mind the two key points to, that will be clearer during this talk. The first one is databases are detail. Databases are detail is, uh, is a concept that is explained very well inside the, the book Clean Architecture. And uh, when I read it for the first time, it blew my mind because I was always uh, um, used to think about uh, uh, the database at, uh, as the base of my architecture. So starting with the structuring the database and next with the interface and business logic. But that's not always a good, a good idea because uh, databases are detail uh, doesn't mean that uh, database is not important. It means that uh, your architecture should not depend on the detail of the database. So I can architect my application without thinking about how many tables will I use, if I will use uh, my SQL implementation or no SQL implementation or uh, Firebase or whichever. I will, I have to abstract my architecture from this detail. The second point is a good architecture allows you to defer critical decision. This will be clear during the rest of the talk. So keep in mind these two points and let's go on. This is the clean architecture diagram that you will find inside the book. I think it's not so easy to read at first sight. So let's uh, take a, a look at it. I will try to explain you the main concept of this uh, uh, diagram. We start from the inner circle, the entities one, and it says that it contains entities. What are entities? Entities are models of our business rules. Okay, so uh, a practical example, if we suppose we are develop, uh, developing an application to search for a restaurant, like the fork, for example, an entity could be the restaurant. So the model restaurant, the entity restaurant belongs to the inner cycle. The next cycle is use cases. Use cases are operations that we can do, apply on our entities. In our uh, restaurant search example, our use cases could be search for restaurant. Or uh, if we are also implementing the administration part, it could be insert a new restaurant or update or delete a restaurant. So all operations that are related to a particular entity. The next circle is the controller or presenter. So if you are familiar with MVP pattern, the presenter lies in the green circle. So the presenters are all the classes, all the components of our architecture that will inter uh, interact with the use cases and will be available for the outsider outside circle the the circle with web devices ui or external interfaces the important rule to understand this diagram is looking at the uh, the small rows that points inward and this is the dependency rule so source code dependencies must point only inward. What does it mean? It means that entities depends only on entities. So the inner cycle, the yellow circle, depends only on this one. It does not know nothing about uh, use cases or controllers or, or external interfaces. Entities knows only about entities. Use cases knows about the entities and use cases. So use cases can depend on entities, but use cases cannot depend on controllers and external interfaces and so on. Controllers can depend on use cases, 
and entities, but not on external interfaces. This is a, a really important rule. Uh, if you don't, um, don't follow this rule, you will break the clean architecture and you will encounter uh, many difficulties on architecting and making your uh, architecture clean and also testable. So think about thinking about uh, an application, a software architecture in um, circles. Um, I think it is a little bit uh, difficult. Uh, so I want you to translate the diagram, not in circles, but in layers, in particular three layers. The first one is the domain, then the presentation and the data. I think that uh, many of you will be familiar with this uh, three layer distinction. In the domain, we will uh, put entities or models. Uh, in the rest of the talk, I will uh, use the model keyword instead of the entities, because uh, with many frameworks, uh, the entity keyword used is used to um, identify data models. So something that uh, is more related to data layer, in particular databases. In the domain, we can put use cases and uh, inter a repository interface uh, following the repository pattern. So an interface that will let us access to the data layer. In the data, we can put the database, APIs, file system, and in, more in general, the implementation of our repository interface. So in the data, we put everything that is related to data storage, uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, care about if um, if it's uh, a store on file system, API, a remote server, or a local database. But everything that is related to that will be handled in the data layer. In the presentation, we put the view, activity, and fragment. If we're talking about Android, more in general, the presenter or view model. So everything that will interact with the presentation and with our user interface. So we can think about these three layers as three modules of our application. Uh, if we are uh, thinking about Gradle implementation, like in Android application, this will be three different modules uh, you can also structure these three layers as uh, different packages, not necessarily uh, different modules, but using different modules will enforce, will, um, um, will make you uh, take advantage of the module dependencies to enforce uh, the dependency rule principle that we've seen before. So let's think about three different, uh, three different modules. At each module has its own SRC source directory and the build.gradle. Let's uh, start with a, a practical example. Um, suppose that we want uh, to build a to-do application. So an application that will, will let me, let me uh, insert and uh, update and see a list of tasks. We'll see this example starting from uh, an, um, uh, some Kotlin code that is not strictly related to an Android implementation. So the first part will be a more generic part that is applicable to uh, every kind of language and uh, framework. And the second part of the example will be more focused on Android. So if we want to implement a to-do application, we will have a, a task as our entity. 
please note that uh, in the upper right corner, I'm putting a, a little icon with a color that will remind you on of the circle that we are in. If you remember the circle diagram, the color that you see here in the upper right corner will reflect the color of the circle diagram. So we start from the inner cycle, the entity, and our entity will be a task. So I don't have, a, suppose that we don't have a, uh, specification of um, uh, of this application. Uh, maybe your customer or your uh, project manager tells you we we want to build a to do application, but we don't have no, nothing about uh, UI or uh, database or remote server. We we need to we we need to start to think about this application without specifications. So we can, we will see how we can do it. We can start from the, the entity task and we can say, okay, a task will have an identifier, a title and a description, a due date and a status. Okay, these are the properties that almost all to do application will handle for a task model. How we can implement this task entity in Kotlin? So the perfect way is to use a data class. So we have a data class task model with each property that is immutable. That is a value, so it's immutable with force immutability. The identifier can be an integer. Title and description maybe will be strings. Okay, due date will be a date and status a task status that is an enumeration. So we can uh, think about test status that are commonly used, but uh, if uh, the, uh, the specification will change adding or removing status, we would just need to change this enumeration class. So, I think um, the uh, data layer, uh, sorry, sorry, the domain layer entities circle is completed. Let's move to the use cases. So we said that the use cases are operation that we can do on tasks. What can we do on a task? Uh, we can get a task or a list of tasks, so retrieve it from our data source insert a new task, update a task, or delete a task. These are the common operations. And how can we implement any Kotlin or any language? We can create four different classes, a class for each use case. By creating a different class for each use case, we enforce the single responsibility principle. Let's start with the get task list use case. A common implementation will have a single execute method, a single public execute method that will return a list of task model. This uh, list of task model will be get, I will get it from uh, somewhere. We will see next uh, where we will get this and just return this task list. In the other use case will be quite the same. So insert the task use case, we will have a public execute method that takes a task model as a parameter. The same for delete and update task. Let's go back to the get task list use case and uh, get more and uh, deep in details with this. So we can, where well, we can get the task list. So we say that in the domain layer, we put a, a repository interface that lets us access to the data layer. So we will call repository.getTaskList, where repository is our interface, and it, the get task list is a, match, a method exposed in the interface. 
we still don't know which will be the correct implementation of this get task list but we don't care right now so we have our interface that will be passed as a dependency to the use case so a little note the code that i will show you does not contain um, specific reference to any dependency injection framework but uh, it's uh, ready to be integrated with any dependency injection framework so if you use dagger if you use coin or whatever you can integrate this code with the dependency injection framework that you like the most okay uh, i have added also a suspend keyword uh, if you are familiar with the kotlin uh, coroutines you know that suspend is a keyword that let me identify a um, function a method that will be executed in a, a in a separate thread just to put it in uh, simple words our repository uh, why, uh, why uh, should i put the suspend keyword because uh, the repository interface uh, the repository implementation uh, will be getting data from some data source so if uh, the data source is a database the file system or uh, api or remote apis uh, i don't really care because you know all those cases it will uh, it will imply an uh, input output operation so some kind of operation that i want to do in a background thread if you think about android development this is mandatory to delegate all input output operation to a background thread so let's go back to the get us list details and let's add also a error handling implementation so i can put a try catch method a try catch close sorry and uh, throw my exception it is this is a naive implementation it is quite generic and we can make something a little better by introducing a result concept the result class that is a wrapper that will contain the result of my operation so we can return a result success containing the task list if everything uh, is okay we can return a result dot error passing the exception if something is wrong and how we can model this result in kotlin we can uh, take advantage of sealed classes to model the result sealed classes are classes that let me implement a well-defined hierarchy of classes so a sealed class result can have a data class success as in, in its hierarchy that will contain a data of a generic type t or another the other implementation will be error that will contain an exception that will wrap an exception and we can also add a third type that is loading to notify when we are loading our data okay let's add also to string uh, implementation that will be uh, very useful uh, for um, debugging and logging purposes we can also define an extension function succeeded that will uh, that i can use to check if the result is a success and data is not null oh, let's move on to the presenter layer so uh just to recap we are trying to architect an application that uh, let me uh, the, to handle a task list but we don't have 
uh, any kind of specification about the UI. So why can we uh, try to think about a presenter, how we can handle the UI without, without the specification? Yes, we can do this. And uh, now I will, uh, will see how we can do it using the MVP pattern, so using the presenter. Uh, the, the next example, the following example will be with uh, the view model, so that we with the uh, MVVM pattern. Uh, I hope we will uh, will not cause any confusion to use uh, now MVP and next time MVVM. But uh, I'll, I'll, I will do it to show you that uh, you can uh, implement the clean architecture also independently with uh, the pattern. The, uh, the MVP or MVVM or any other kind of presentation pattern that you want to implement. So let's go on with the presenter. Suppose that we have a presenter, we can write the presenter that depends on the task list. My presenter will be responsible of showing the list of tasks. So it will depend on the task list use case to access, to get the list of tasks. The presenter will not uh, uh, refer directly to the um, to the repository, but we will use get task list use case. So there we get the result on we attach it, and uh, we can switch our behavior on the result. So if the result is loading, we will render a loading view. My view is uh, an interface. Uh, in the MVP pattern. If the result is success, we can render our task list, uh, maybe in a recycle view if we're using an, uh, if we're implementing it in Android. And we can, in case of error, we will render an error message. Because uh, get task list use case dot execute is a suspended method, we must call it with a specific coroutine scope, okay, using a US scope dot launch. So here we have uh, the structure of our presentation that is completely independent of the UI. We, uh, we don't care how the UI will be implemented. And uh, also we don't care if the UI will be an Android user interface or uh, also it can be a, a command line interface. This, uh, this, button, this uh, presenter is applicable in uh, many scenarios and not tied to a specific framework. Okay, so also the UI scope will be injected in the presenter constructor. So let's go with uh, some Android specific uh, implementations. And uh, to start, uh, we talk about uh, a little bit about live data, just an introduction. If uh, some of you doesn't know what live data, live data is, uh, you th can think about live data as um, uh, observables that uh, are uh, life cycle aware. So they, knows about, they know about the state of your activity or fragment or view. We have uh, three kinds of live data. The first one is the live data that is uh, observable that can be only observed. So we can call observe on it. A mutable live data, that is a live data that can be also mutated. We can change the state of the live data by calling, for example, post value. And a mediator live data, that is a live data that can be mutated and can, that can listen, listen for other live data. So it can observe other live data. This is a, a very, very quick introduction to live data, but uh, maybe it's all that you need to know to understand the rest of the talk. 
So let's see how we can uh, take advantage of uh, lab data in our architecture. In our uh, use case, we will put a uh, private mutable lab data that will handle our result. So as the first, uh, first thing when we call the execute method, we will call result.postValue loading. So we will inform the observer, we will notify the observer that we are started to loading our task list. This will be useful if we want to show some kind of loading uh, uh, user interface, like a, a spinner or, or a progress. Next, we change the return result success with result post value. So we are changing our mutable lab data, telling that, notifying that we have received the task list and we're ready to notify the task list. And in case of error, we will, we will do a post value result error. Okay, let's uh, change the signature of execute method. We want to return our result, we will uh, return void, and we will, call, we will create an observe method that will expose my result mutable live data with, uh, as a live data. Doing uh, well, like this, we will force our, um, uh, the external classes, other classes to uh, read, to get our result, to observe our result without, uh, uh, without uh, giving them the permission to modify it. So internally we treat the result as a mutable live data. We want to be able to mutate the state of the result internally, but we don't want that from outside this class, uh, other classes will be able to mutate. So we'll we will expose the result as a live data that is not mutable. Let's jump to the UI. So can we go on with the UI a little bit? You're trying to implement something about the UI without any specification? Yes, we will try to do it. And uh, if we think about our task uh, list presented on a uh, uh, recycle view, for example, we will have a, a row for each task model. And how we can model this uh, UI representation of a task? We can do it using a specific data class task UI model. So a model that is related to the UI representation of the task. We will put the, inside this model all the properties that we want to display. So title, description, the due date, and status. And if you notice, I, will, I have um, used the string for every property. Why? Because uh, three, uh, the property displayed will be always displayed as a string. So I will, uh, I want to enforce this to be string in my UI model. So they are ready to be binded to a views, to text views, for example. But how we can uh, transform our task model to our task UI model? We will do it by implementing a mapper. So a mapper is uh, a class that will uh, take an input parameter, an output parameter, and map the input to the output. So the task UI model mapper will, will, will implement the mapper interface that takes an, in, an input task model and will return a task UI model. So title will be the same as title, description will be the same. The data will be formatted to the format that we want to be displayed. Remember that the task model date 
was a date object, not a string object. And we will format also our status with some kind of logic that we'll, we'll implement in the future. Okay, just note that uh, this, uh, this is a class that is responsible only to map a model to another model. So uh, again, we don't uh, depend uh, on um, a specific framework, a specific uh, uh, library or specific um, uh, so data sources. So it is highly testable with, with unit test. Okay, let's go with a view model implementation. Okay, before we've seen our presenter implementation, now we see how we can achieve the same result with a view model implementation. So again, our view model will depend on the get task list use case to obtain the list of tasks. And we will have a UI model live data. So a live data that will uh, expose a list of task UI models on uh, so something specific to the UI representation. And uh, as a first thing in the init method, we will uh, start to observe the get last uh, task list use case. And uh, Next, we add uh, these two rows. This uh, private vol underscore UI model live data, that is a mediator live data. And then this is uh, the live data that I will use internally in my task list view model to notify, to change the data, the UI task model updates. Using this notation with um, this construct with underscore UI model live data and next uh, UI model live data that has getter returns underscore UI model live data, let me use the mediator live data, so a mutable live data uh, inside my task list view model and expose it as a read only live data, so an immutable live data. So we need to combine the underscore UI model live data with the get task list use case observable. So we need to add it as a source to our to my mediator live data. It means that UI model live data will be notified every time that get task list use case observe will be updated. And we will apply a function to the result of this observable. So every time it's updated, it will be applied a function. And this function will, will implement this logic. If the result is a success, I want to update my live data with the result data. But to, we can uh, we cannot do this. This will uh, give us a compilation problem because we are trying to update the UI model live data with uh, a list of task model and not with a list of task UI model. So we need to implement a mapping function. So we will map our list of task model to a list of task UI model by using the task UI model mapper that we've seen before. So with this construct, we have a UI model live data that will automatically be updated when the get task list use case completes. But we're still missing some key points. So we can take advantage of the Kotlin construct uh, lambda function to, you know, to put it outside and avoid the observe keyword. 
and also we need to call an execute method to invoke to start the retrieval of the task list and we will use the, uh, the view model scope for this operation okay the same thing uh, can be done for uh, the other th two cases loading and error so for the loading live data we will uh, expose the mediator live data uh, um, in the same way we, that we've done with the UI model live data. And uh, the same will be with the uh, error live data. And then we can put it all together like this. It seems uh, uh, quite complicated at first, but it's a structure that we can um, uh, reuse in uh, whatever whatever we want. So if you're talking about, uh, here we're talking about uh, uh, getting a, a list of tasks from a uh, data source. But if we're talking about searching for a restaurant, for example, or, um, or showing a list of, of other things, this view model, this structure for, the, for our view model can be reused. Uh, please note that uh, for error live data, I've used a particular implementation that is a single live event. Single live event uh, is a, a particular kind of uh, live data that is notified just once. And why should I use this for the, for the error case? Because uh, suppose that uh, we have um, our get task list use case will notify us with an error. And uh, in uh, our interface, uh, the error will be rendered correctly the first time. But if we rotate the screen or change the configuration, as you know, the activity and fragment will be destructed and uh, recreated, destroyed and recreated. And uh, the binding of the lab data will be recreated, presenting so the error again, so the error live data will be called again if we use a simple live data. And we will have a, a second error message that maybe is not related, is a little outdated. So to avoid the double or multiple uh, notification of the error state, we will use single live event. So let's move on a little bit to the UI implementation. We still don't have any specification about the UI, but we still want to go on in our implementation and try to uh, implement, to understand how to bind everything together. So suppose that we have a fragment that will be responsible of rendering our task list. So the first thing will be to get the instance of a view model and uh, listen, observe the UI model live data. So each time the UI model live data will be notified, the render UI model function will be called. Okay, for example, we can think uh, about our cycle view as a perfect uh, view container for our task list. Uh, please note that uh, UI model live data, when it is observed, uh, we must pass the uh, view lifecycle owner uh, property of the fragment. And uh, this is the moment in which the live data will know how to handle the life cycle of the fragment. Okay, so before we, uh, before this, before this instruction, your model of data doesn't does know doesn't know about uh, doesn't know about the life cycle. So we can test it. We can use the live data in unit testing without providing any information about the life cycle. And passing the view life cycle owner, we can in fact 
tell the UI model live data, be aware of this life cycle. So if the UI model live data is notified by the use case when the application is in background or more in general, while the fragment is in state paused on, uh, or stopped, automatically the live data will, uh, the UI model live data will not be no notified. So it will not be updated, but it will be updated only when the fragment uh, returns in uh, the started state. Okay, so when it's resumed, it will be notified and the uh, UI will be rendered correctly in the correct moment. The same for loading. So every time loading is called, we will render our loading view and the same for error. Render loading and render error are uh, implementation details that we don't care about it right now. So again, we have a fragment structure that we can reuse multiple times for many, many different scenarios. So let's try to do a recap of what we've seen today. A good architecture allows you to defer critical decision. As you've seen, through the example, we we did uh, we constantly deferred the decision decision about uh, how the UI will be handled, how we will display our task list in a recycle view or in a grid view. We don't care. Um, also, the where we get the the task list. Uh, uh, we have deferred the decision if we want to use a local database or uh, we will uh, refer to, we will call uh, remote APIs. We don't care right now. Uh, all, we didn't uh, get into the details of the data layer, but it's quite the same as concept as we've seen for the presentation layer. So every time we move the step forward by deferring other decision. What about UI, database, APIs? As we've seen, we don't care, we don't really care right now. So we can start to architecture of our application and the business and implement the business logic of our application without having details about the UI, about where we get uh, data and about where if we use remote APIs or not, we, if we have a network request, we don't really care right now. And it's really good because it will force you to use, uh, to be independent uh, from uh, uh, sources that are slow. Uh, think about database and APIs. How many times did you created some software that uh, depends on the remote APIs and maybe APIs are not working or are not completed. If you lost a lot of time trying to test your application, try to call uh, APIs that are not working, finding out why they do not work, if it's uh, an API problem, if uh, it's uh, your uh, problem with your business logic. So we, by going independent from uh, API, you will have an architecture that is and implement only your business rules. And you can test only your business logic without having to care about what if, uh, if the remote APIs are working or not. And we will make your development life cycle and testing life cycle much, much faster. So it seems a lot of code to write, uh, yes. It's uh, quite a lot. Uh, maybe you can uh, render, uh, you can do the same uh, in Android by writing all uh, uh, all methods inside an activity class. But uh, if you are uh, an Android developer, you know that you don't have to do it because it will uh, lead uh, to more problems than results. Um, so don't do it. But uh, if you are going to write uh, a little bit of more code, you're also going to um, 
spending less time in debugging. And we as developer uh, love to, developers love to write code and developers hate to debug and find uh, search for bugs. <laughs> so um, just a little bit of more code can lead a less amount of uh, debugging. Also using different classes and enforcing the single responsibility uh, principle, we will uh, um, have, uh, uh, we will, uh, it will be easier to find uh, the specific point of uh, of a source of a bug. For example, if uh, uh, your if a client tells you, oh, "Well, wow, the due date is not displayed correctly," uh, please fix it as as soon as possible. Uh, you already know where you have to check for bug. So one possible um, one possible source is the mapper class. So you will check if the mapper is behaving correctly, if the, the, uh, the uh, due date is mapped correctly, and if it's mapped correctly, maybe it's a problem of your data source that is passing you a wrong date. So um, a little bit uh, more code, but less time in the bugging. So that's... Uh, um, that's all for this talk. I think that uh, before going with QA, you see, I should uh, give you. No, no. If Lucy wants to introduce the Q and A session, and if you want to wait for some other question to come up. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you for the webinar. Thank you for your time. Um, I would just like to take the chance to thank once again our sponsor, AWS Amplify, for supporting this webinar. Um, and to let you know that our next webinar will be Tuesday, the 21st of July, um, for anybody that would like to join us then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, Andrea, you will be taking questions, I believe. Um, yes. Yeah. Any in the in the YouTube comments there to kick you off. Okay, so let's start um, uh, with the first question that I see here. Uh, what is the purpose of using Mediator Live Data? Can we simply use Live Data? So we need to use Mediator Live Data we, when we want to combine different Live Data. So have we seen in the, index, in the previous example we used the Mediator Live Data? For example, for the to update the UI live data, the UI live data property uh, doesn't uh, doesn't do much. Uh, or it just uh, it's just responsible to observe another live data, so the use case, and transform it. So map the result of the use case to a list of task UI model. So here we, we can do it using simple live data. We need to use a mediator live data that observe another live data and then you apply a function to transform the result to another, uh, another kind of live data. And next, uh, why do we need separate live data object? Uh, can we handle in them in one? Yes, you can use just one uh, live data. I'd like to, um, I like to use uh, three different live data uh, for um, uh, many reasons. The first one is that, uh, as we, we have seen, error can be handled as uh, a single live event, and uh, UI and loading can be handled as uh, a um, uh, common live data. This is because when uh, my application changes state, uh, I want to be notified with uh, state, uh, the last state of loading or uh, the UI model, but I don't want to be notified with uh, an error message that maybe was already notified. So it means something uh, that is uh, outdated and an outdated message. 
And uh, also another case is that when you have to when you have an interface where we have where you are loading multiple uh, objects, so maybe you're loading uh, your task list, but also you're loading in background some other uh, data that you don't want to handle uh, as uh, loading, so you don't want to display a loading uh, progress. And uh, having three different uh, live data lets you be more flexible, is more flexible. You can um, listen just for the things that you want to listen. When using ROM, we use a certain annotation, a dozen that violate clean architecture. Uh, so, uh, the first part of the talk, uh, I've said that uh, I wanted to use uh, the keyword model instead of entity. And this is the uh, right example. So in Roma, we have the entity keyword. And the entity keyword uh, uh, seems uh, uh, related to the model is, uh, as uh, one is can be tempted to uh, in, in, insert annotations inside our task model, for example. Uh, I do not advise to, you to do this. I, uh, it is better to create a task data model, so a ta or task entity, uh, so a separate data class that is uh, that is related to room implementation. So another class that are that is have all the annotations for room, and you will have a mapper interface, a mapper class, a mapper implementation that will map uh, your task entity to a task model and vice versa. OK, so the next one is, again, about the three observable instead of one. Uh, the the, uh, my thoughts are the same as before. Uh, Kennedy points out that there is uh, a lot of code. I can think that um, I can advise you to uh, take advantage of your ID, uh, like Android Studio or IntelliJ, uh, live templates. So you can create live templates with your uh, base, basic fragment or view model implementation. So you can uh, code more faster. And please remember that uh, um, writing uh, uh, more code uh, as, or writing less code is not an excuse, to, uh, is not a way to go faster. Uh, many developers think that l writing less code uh, means uh, de uh, deploying faster, so reaching your uh, uh, result faster. But it's not correct because many times you can uh, write uh, less code, but the code must, must be also readable and must be open to changes. So uh, another great goal of clean architecture is that your code will be uh, open to changes. It will, um, uh, it will be easier to change your code according to changing specifics in uh, following the, the, the agile idea. So I can uh, I write faster, I, I deploy faster without the need of, of all specification, but I can adapt it to the specification. So uh, use uh, live templates, use templates to uh, to generate your code faster. Uh, what about using two mappers, one DTO to entity and the second entity to model UI? Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, what I was uh, saying before. Uh, so we have uh, in the complete example, you will, have, you will have three models, one for the UI, the task UI model, one for your business source, the task model, and one for your uh, data layer, so a task entity or task data model. And uh, you will have two mappers, a mapper that will map uh, from the data layer to the business uh, 
to the domain layer and uh, a mapper that will map from the business to the presentation layer. Uh, yes, I have also a code sample that I will share in with you on my uh, Twitter and LinkedIn profile in the following days because I have to uh, adjust uh, some some code, um, fix a couple of bugs, and then I will share it. So follow my follow me on my social uh, social accounts, and I will share the code on GitHub. I think uh, that uh, we have no more question. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you very much for this webinar. And uh, this webinar will be published very soon on the DroidCon Italy YouTube channel. And uh, don't miss the next webinar on uh, 21st of July. We'll, uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, resume and how to build uh, this hiring funnel, then in these COVID times, it's very important to, <laughs> to build the resume. So thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, see you again. Hope you enjoyed Con Italy on the 27th of November. Thank you again, Andrea. See you. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Doricon. Thank everybody.